We all face difficult moments in our lives where we find ourselves asking ourselves the question, what can I do when there's nothing that I can do? And so we decided to talk about the dark room. What is a dark room? Well, the dark room is a place um, where it's uncertain, it's frustrating, you feel stuck, a place of pain, a place where you can't fix anything. It's, it's, it's the dark room. So why did we call it the dark room? Because God uses these moments to develop us, exactly like how we would take a 35 millimeter film, take it to London Drugs, drop it off at the counter, and they would take it into a room that is dark, called the dark room, and in there they would take all the negatives, your pictures that you took with an old school camera, because we're not talking about cell phone cameras, we're talking about back in the 80s and the 90s, where things were a lot more painful, more difficult and you'd have to wait a little longer, yes? Yeah, they would take, they, they take that film, that 35 millimeter film, into a dark room where in that dark room it has a process. Can you say process? Process. Process is always time consuming. Process is sometimes annoying. Process can be uncertain. Process could be the unknown. Process could be painful. Process can become hard to withstand. And so when you take the 35 millimeter film, you take it to the back room, and in that back room, there's nine chemicals that your negatives have to go through in order for a picture to come out. And for us to see the final, final product of what we imagined when we took that picture. Well, guess what? The dark room is very synonymous to our moments of life when we are in process. And so while you're in the dark room, catch this, while you're in the dark room, it feels like God is absent feels like he's apathetic, or it feels like he's angry. feels like God is absent. He's not there. He's not here. He's not listening. feels like he's apathetic. It feels like he doesn't care. You, you might think, well, he might be worrying about somebody else that is more important than me, and so God is not here. He's apathetic. He doesn't care about me. Or sometimes, when we're in our moments of dark room, when we're in our dark room moments, we feel like God is punishing us because he's angry at us. So you slipped up. You did a mistake. You took a wrong step, and now something bad is happening, and you're going, ah, I'm in my dark room. And it's because God is punishing me. God is angry at me. But I'm going to tell you this, and I want to clear this out right from the get-go like I have for the past two weeks. While you're in your dark room, God is not absent. God is not apathetic, and he is not angry with you. He already poured that out on the cross with Jesus Christ, and this is why we love Jesus, because he took our punishment. He took that anger. He took that wrath and put it on himself, and he did not deserve it. Say amen. Now, there are questions that are going to pop up in the, in the dark room, and we've been looking at these questions. When you're in a dark room moment where you can't do anything to fix what you want to fix, here are some questions. Number one, will I ever be happy again? You think that the pain that you're going through is going to last forever. Will I ever be happy again? I mean, it's been nine months, and I still can't feel joy, and I, I can't feel satisfaction. Or you might even say, man, this is, this is, this is a, 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 a cyclical thing. This is, this is, this is a cycle. Every September, this happens to me. Will I ever be happy again for next year in September? And you start wondering these questions, will I ever be happy? And another question that pops is this, how can anything good come from this? Can anything good come from this whole thing? Like it's so dark, this room is so, so dark, dark, dark. I can't see anything good coming out of this. Or the other question, which is probably one of the most craziest questions is this, is there a point in continuing? When we're in our dark rooms, we don't feel like fighting. We don't feel like we should keep on fighting. We don't feel like we want to keep on fighting. And then we ask ourselves this question. This problem seems like I'm never going to be happy. Again, this problem seems like um, there's nothing good that's going to come out of it. So is there even a point for me to keep on fighting? Is there even a point for me to keep on fighting? And here's the thing about the dark room. You have no idea what or who hangs in the balance of your decision to remain faithful when remaining faithful is difficult. That's true. That's true. And we saw this in the first week where the Apostle Paul, he's planting churches, he's doing all these beautiful things, and at his peak of his momentum, at the peak of his momentum, he gets put in prison, a literal dark room. And all he had to do was say, I don't believe in Jesus, I believe in Nero. Right. And he would have been out of his dark room. See, it's that light that we want so bad that we think is going to heal us, rescue us, but it's actually going to destroy us and bring us down further. And so he refused to do the easy wrong and he took the hard right in his dark room and he's like, I gotta do something. And he started writing letters to the churches that he had planted and that's where we get some of our epistles like Galatians, Philippians, sorry, Philippians, um, Ephesians, and I forget the other, Colossians and Philemon. We get those letters because he wrote them down while he was in his dark room because he's like, I'm not going to choose to remain faithless. I will not be faithless. 
I will remain faithful when everything around me, when everyone around me is telling me, be faithless. The Apostle Paul took that decision. And so he writes down these letters, and these letters are now being studied today. We live by the principles in those letters. We study them here 2019 years later. That's powerful. Give God glory. It's amazing. Now, now the crazy thing is this. The Apostle Paul had no clue. The Apostle Paul had no clue. What hung in the balance of his decision to remain faithful when remaining faithful was difficult? He had no clue. He just started writing these letters. He had no clue that what hung in the balance was you and me. He had no clue. And so when you're in your dark room, you have no idea what hangs in the balance of your decision to remain faithful when remaining faithful in your dark room is difficult. Before we get into the scripture, I want to give you four truth statements, four truth statements, four statements of truth that have to do with comfort. Here's the first one. Are you ready? There is a natural bond between those who have suffered deeply and similarly. There's a natural bond that shapes. There's a natural bond that happens between those who have suffered deeply and similarly. So two people that have suffered deeply and similarly, they don't have to know each other. They don't have to understand each other. They don't have to have the same background. They don't have to have the same race. They don't have to do any of this. They don't have to have any history with each other. But anytime that two people that have suffered deeply and similarly, there's an automatic bond that goes beyond race, that goes beyond theology, and that goes beyond education. Because there's this level of understanding, there's something supernatural when two people have suffered similarly and deeply, deeply and similarly. Here's the second one. Those who've suffered, those who have suffered, are uniquely qualified to comfort those who are suffering. So in other words, when someone who's suffered walks into the room to comfort someone who's suffering, something very powerful takes place. When someone who has suffered walks into the room and sees someone that is suffering, something powerful takes place we can say all the right things we can do all the right things to comfort someone who is suffering and it possibly can work but sometimes it doesn't work but when someone who has suffered walks into their dark room and steps in it's a totally different story why because those who've suffered are uniquely qualified to comfort those who are suffering here's the third truth statement comfort from those who've been comforted is life giving to those who need comfort. So when someone is in a dark, dark place that feels hopeless and they meet someone who's been there but they've survived it, a sense of hope arises in that heart of the one who is suffering presently. When someone who has suffered and someone has been in a very, very dark, dark, dark place and they're out and they've made it, and they've persevered, and they've allowed perseverance to finish its work. Yeah, when this person who has suffered steps into the room of a person who is in their dark room, which was the one that they were in before, yeah, when this this person that is suffering presently has a sense of hope because they got through it. And if they got through it, they can get through it. But here's the main point for today, and here's the main one that I want us to focus on tonight. And this is the thing that Paul, actually talks to us about in one of the letters that he writes to one of the churches he planted. He says, and and, and the the point is this, this is the premise, comforting is life-giving to the comforter as well. I know that this might not blow your mind. I know that you might be saying, man, I thought you were going to give me something deep or something better, something more like, you were supposed to give me something that rhymes. I know, I understand. I know this is simplistic, but it's powerful. And we're going to unpack this whole thing. Once we unpack this whole thing, I believe in the name of Jesus, you will leave different tonight. Comforting is life-giving to the comforter as well. When you've been through a dark room and find someone walking in that same room, someone that's struggling with what you struggled with, someone that has been hurting with what you've hurt before, someone that was in your dark room, in the dark room that you were in before, when you find someone that like this, that has been hurting with the thing that you once hurt, suddenly a sense of purpose begins to arise in you. When you see someone struggling with the pains that you've gone through, I mean, you've, you, you know your rainy days. 
You remember the hard times that you've gone through. You know the painful moments you've suffered with. You know the thoughts that have driven you crazy. You know the memories that pain you. You know the experiences in the past that hurt you, that whenever they come up, they just completely, just completely shut you down. You know these things. And guess what? When you see someone else going through the same pains, I mean, you could even tell because you know your facial expressions when you're going through it. You know their facial expressions too. You know the hints that they might throw in certain conversations because you've thrown the same hints. You know the types of posts you've liked on Instagram because you've done it. And so when they're liking those same posts, you know what's going on. And, and the reason why we know this is because here, here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. That we know. Yes. We just know. And we understand. We know and we understand. And so when you see someone struggling with the same thing you've been struggling with, when you see someone in a dark room that you've been into, that you've come through, a sense of purpose begins to arise in your heart. And you're like, mm-hmm. Yes. This is why I went through what I went through. There's this thing that happens and now you have a sense of responsibility. Now you have meaning. Now there's purpose. Now there's life in the dark room. Now there's wisdom in the dark room. Now there's meaning, fulfillment, purpose in that dark room. Because comforting is life giving to the comforter as well. Suddenly you realize something good can come out of my dark room. It's in those moments where we come to the realization that I now understand the purpose of what I went through. I now understand why I was in that dark room for so long. And this is the realization that every hero that we read about came to and embraced. They never saw a disconnect between a loving God and a dark room. The heroes we read about The heroes that we admire, the people that gave us what we call the Bible, the people that we look to when it comes to us looking for faith, the people that we learn from, the people that we study. Hey, let me tell you something about these people, these heroes. They never saw a disconnect between a loving God and a bad dark room. Instead, they embraced that reality. Instead, They brought comfort to those who were in a dark room. A dark room they'd been in or a dark room that they were in. And reality is, this is what inspires us. And this is what gives us hope. Watching people go through a dark room, watching people persevere through a dark room, watching people comfort others while they're in their dark room and they're comforting other people. See, look, I want to tell you something. Humanity gets inspired by that. Let me explain to you. Why do you think we like superhero movies? Billions of dollars are spent in the superhero movie industry. Why? Because we love the fact that we get to witness, that we get to see, that we get to listen to, that we get to taste someone rescuing another. We are inspired not by stories where people went through a dark room and they quit. We don't get inspired when someone goes to a dark room and they made it all by themselves and that's the period at the end of the story. We get inspired. We grow in hope. When we see someone get through their dark room or they're getting through their dark room and they're helping someone else be comforted in their dark room. Why? Because the comforter also finds life and comforting. So as we close this entire series, I want us to look back at the role of comfort in your life and in our lives and the people around us. Because this part, this is part of the answer to the question, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? Giving this, embracing this reality, embracing this concept, learning from our heroes. Yeah, this is part of the answer to the question that we've been looking at for the past three weeks. What do you do when there's nothing that you can do? What do you do when there's really nothing you can do to fix it? Move forward or have a way out. Well, here, it's very simple. 
if we look at this reality, we embrace this truth, this is part of the answer. And so Paul decides to talk to this church that he planted. It's called the church in Corinth. And he writes two letters to them. He writes three, but we only have two that we're going to be reading about. And it's called 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is what he says. Watch this. He says this. Are you guys ready for this? Yes. This is what he says. He says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of? Passion. And the God of all? So we hit the pause button right here, okay? Because th there's something really interesting here. Here's what's really interesting about this. He says, praise be to the God and Father of all, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. But hold on, just watch this. There's something very interesting that happens here. Here's what happens. 12 chapters later, 12 chapters after he writes this, Paul tells us that God gives him a thorn in his flesh a dark room, a dark room experience. 12 chapters after Paul goes, the God of the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. 12 chapters later, this Father of compassion, this God of all comfort, gives Paul a thorn in the flesh. And what's crazy is this, that Paul asked God, take it away, change it, because that's what we do when we get into our dark rooms. We go, God, take this dark room away, take this thing away, change this circumstance, the situation. And three times Paul prayed for it, and God refused. To which we answer, see, that's the problem. To which we go, that's, that's, see, that's, that's the problem. Paul's confirming what I don't want to accept. And what I don't want to accept that I can't comprehend in my mind is, how can I trust a good God that allows bad things? And this is a problem. <laughs> that we don't correlate a loving God with a dark room because we have a different perspective. And he's saying, hey, but you know what? God is the God of all comfort. No, 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 but I don't understand. He gave you a thorn in your flesh. You asked him to remove it three times and three times God refused and he threw you a sentence. My grace is made perfect in your weakness. What the heck is that supposed to do? I want you to change it. And this is our attitude sometimes. And we ask the question, how can I trust that God is the father of compassion and the God of all comfort when he allows bad things to happen? And see, Paul understood something. Paul understood this dilemma that happens inside our hearts. He understood this because he confirmed it. Yes, God does allow bad things to happen, but I still continue to believe. I still continue to trust that God is the God of compassion and the source of all my comfort. I choose to believe that. I choose to believe that. That he is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. And the word comfort here isn't just a sympathy pat on the back type of thing, just to let you know. When Paul writes this down, he's not choosing the word comfort as synonymously to him. I understand. Instead, the word that he chooses to write and express comfort is a word that God just gives you strength, a boldness, and a courage. And he energizes you by stealing your will away to quit and giving you a will to keep on going. It's a courage and a strength it's a supernatural ability that we sometimes don't understand because it's the mystery of I can do all things through Christ who gives me his strength. Yes. Paul says this, this is the type of God that I serve. That in spite of what's happened to me, in spite of what God has allowed to come at me, he's the God of all comfort. The word comfort is not just sympathy. It's not just, let me pat you on the back, you can do it, little Billy. No, it's a boldness and a courage to keep on going. It's a supernatural strength for you to keep going while you're in your dark room. So let's read this again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, watch this, who comforts us in our troubles. Now let's ask this question. Okay, let's ask this question. We're going to hit the pause button one more time. When you're going through your dark room, are you really praying for comfort? Like, do you go, oh God, comfort thy soul. Like, when, when, when you're going through the breakup, are you going, God, comfort me. When, when, when you're going through that failing report that you have to show to your parents, they will just get so disappointed because you already disappointed them the first trimester. So now you got to go and disappoint them all over again. 
Are you going, God, give me comfort? When you feel lonely and like no one likes you and everybody's rejecting you, are you going, God, I pray for comfort? When, when, when you don't understand how to fix the thing that you want to fix because the thing ain't fixing itself and you don't know how to fix the thing, are you going, God, would you please just give me? When that battle inside your mind is taking place and you can't fix your thoughts and your thoughts are screaming louder than what your knowledge tells you is right or true, are you going, God, give me comfort? No, you're not. You know what you're praying for? This is what we pray for. We go, God, change this. God, change my circumstances. Make it go. We don't typically pray in that order or fashion. God, give me comfort. You pray and ask God to make the problem go away. And here's what Paul is saying. In in the circumstances, God chooses to change. Here's what Paul is saying, that in the circumstances that God chooses to change for you, here's what Paul is saying, let me say this one more time, that in the circumstances that God chooses to change for you, you can count on God's comfort. But in the situations that God does not decide to change for you, you can count God, comfort. Even if he doesn't. Watch this. Here's what he says next. So that. So that. So that I could feel better. God will come for me so that I could feel better. God will come for me so that this problem could go away. God chooses to comfort you through it all. So that the circumstance could change. No, no, no. He says something else. So that God chooses. Watch this. He comforts us all in all our troubles so that you can. You can. Now that you can, that you can implies that God is going to give you ability to do something. Because can means that there's something that you have been enabled to. Something that God will give you ability for. Something that God will empower you to do. That even though you can't, he can. Because he can through you. That even though I can't, he can. And he can through me. See, this implies that you can. So, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can Comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You see, our our prayer is this. I hope I can be comforted so that I can get out of this whole thing. So that I can change my circumstance. I hope I can be comforted so that I can overcome this dark room. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. You're not comforted to be comfortable. That's a different comfort zone. You got to switch from what the world calls a comfort zone to a different zone that you got to walk in. You're not comforted so that you can be comfortable. You're comforted. God comforts us in all our troubles. And the reason why is this, so that we can have the ability to comfort other people to which we go, I'd just rather you change this whole thing, not comfort me in it. Like sometimes we're like, we're like, we're like, oh my God. And some of us are like, yeah, that's so true. And some of us are like, wait, 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 wait. I don't want to be comforted to comfort others. Like why can't just, like, why can't God just change it for me? Like instead of comfort me, comforting me so that I can comfort others, why, why can't you just take me out of this whole thing? And then Paul goes and he says this, Paul's like this. Here's what you and I have to understand. That God will sometimes deliver you from it, but oftentimes he'll deliver you through it because he's doing something in you. Watch this, catch this. For people. Sometimes Paul's going, Paul's saying this. He's trying to teach us something very powerful that sometimes we miss, and this is why. We circle around and circle around and get worse and worse and worse. Because we have the wrong perspective of God. Paul's like, 
Don't, don't, don't take that perspective where you want God to rescue and take you out and change your circumstance all the time. Because you need to receive comfort. And comfort's not received so that you can be comfortable. And we're like, no, but I don't want to receive comfort to be, I just, I just, I don't want to comfort other people. I just want, I want this thing to go away. And Paul's like, hey, hold up, hold up, hold up. I get you. I understand that dilemma. But sometimes God will deliver you from it. He'll change it. He'll take it. But oftentimes God chooses, watch this, pay attention, to deliver you through it. Because he's doing something in you. For people. And this is why you got to let it work. You got to let perseverance finish its work. Verse 5, he continues and says, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ. So in other words, just as there are parallels between what we suffer with and what Jesus suffers with. Jesus suffered, we suffer. What he's trying to do is trying to tell us there's a parallel that Jesus does understand you. Jesus does comprehend your suffering, your dark moments, because he went through the same things. He suffered the same way. He says, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, watch this, so also, there's that connection between the first two, the first statement and this next one, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Here's what Paul's trying to say. Our capacity to comfort is determined by the degree which we've suffered. Our capacity to comfort is determined by the degree to which we've suffered. Suffer a little, you can help a little. You suffer much, you have much to help. And there's a power in comforting other people. There's a power when the degree of suffering has been great or much. There's, there, there's this power that God gives us, this influence that God gives us, this anointing that God gives us when we've suffered to a high degree. And this is why when you've been in a dark room, like when you've been in a very dark, dark, dark room, how many of you have been in a dark room before? Hands up. How many of you are going through a dark room right now? Yeah. Amen. I believe both my feet too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, catch this. This, this is why when, when you've been in a dark room, a dark, dark room, and people are trying to cheer you up, and people are trying to make you feel better, and people are trying to encourage you, sometimes the only thing that wants to come out of your heart and your mind is the shut up. <laughs> watch, 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 watch the next thing. Okay, watch the next thing. Here, watch the next thing. You don't understand. And you're right. And you're right. They do not understand. And that's why it's so futile in their attempt. I mean, they mean well. I mean, they have good intentions and they want to make you feel better. They want to do things to cheer you up. They want to do things to encourage you. And all you're doing is putting some type of effort inside your heart to really go through with what they're saying. But deep down inside, you're going, you just don't understand. But when someone else who does steps in, there's that power. Everything changes. Because they say, me too. Our capacity to comfort is determined by the degree to which we've suffered. Don't waste your dark room. There's something powerful about about being face to face with someone who understands because they've been where you are. It's like an inner strength is born because if they got out, there's comfort for you to get out too. And that's why Paul is like, God is the God of all comfort. And he comforts us through other people. But he doesn't just comfort us so that we can feel comfortable. He does it because someone, somewhere, is going through your dark room. And when you step in, you can say, I know. I understand you. Someone, somewhere, is going through your dark room. And when you step in, 
in because you went through it. You can walk up to that person, stare them eyeball to eyeball and say, I know, I understand. There is life on the other side of this. And I come to proclaim and I come to say to you and I speak to you, you can get through this. There is life on the other side. There is a hope that is greater, stronger, more able than your dark room. You can. You can. Think about that sentence. Someone, somewhere, is going to be or is in the dark room that God is using to develop something in you. Do it for yourself. Do it for your family. Do it for the people. Do it with God's strength. Because you have a ministry. And you have life to give. And you have a light to shine. And you have a purpose to fulfill. And then he continues and he says this. If we are distressed, verse 6. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are distressed. why, Why does he say if we are distressed? Because here's the thing. Paul was preaching all over. He was going from city to city. And then he had a team. And they were going. And guess what? As they're in their purpose, they face many dark rooms. And they start getting stoned. Paul was once left for dead and someone had to wake him up. He thought he was in the third heaven. But he actually is like, come, get back to life. He was left for dead. They were thrown into prisons. They were mocked and humiliated. They had to be mocked and humiliated, not at a local level, at a global level possibly, because the leaders of the most influence, influential city was the one mocking them trying to suppress them. They were caught between the middle of two very strong powers, the empire and the religious Jewish people, the temple, the empire, the temple, the Christians right here in the middle, the tiny little group of people believing in a guy called Jesus. This huge organization hated them. This big organization called the empire hated them even more and they were killing them. And then to make things worse, these two large organizations that were on the side and and were were on the external sides of this little organization called the Christians, yeah, they teamed up and they came against the Christians. So Paul was mocked, he was humiliated, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked. He he went through a lot of painful moments where they had to whip him. He almost died, I think like 108 billion times. And he says this, if we're distressed, huh? It is for your comfort. Like we did it and we went through it. Mm -hmm. For you. My goodness. He's saying, if I can do all this and I can get through that, Mm -hmm. you guys watching can do it too. You listening, you can get through it too. And he says, if we are comforted, It is for your comfort. So if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Once again, if we're comforted, it's not so that we could be comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's for people. It's for others. It's for you. So he has this theme that if I'm comforted, it's not so that I can feel better and have my circumstance changed. That's a byproduct, maybe. The reason why I'm comforted is for you. Yes. Oh my God. And then he continues. He says, so let's read that one more time. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Watch this. Which produces in you, read that with me, patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. Verse 7, let's finish this off. And our hope for you is firm. Because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. In this little letter, called Second Corinthians, in this chapter, chapter one, in this letter are the life-giving words that we will need to hang on to when we are in the dark rooms of life. Because for some of you, this is where you will find your initial purpose for your pain. This is where some of you will find your baby steps to take for your pain. Because you can waste 
the pain. But you can capitalize Mm -hmm. on the pain, determining your perspective. Because oftentimes we're saying, why didn't God just bail me out? Mm -hmm. Why didn't he just change the circumstance? Why didn't God take the pain away? Why am I still in this dark room? And it's because God has designed comfort to be given or received, sorry. And you can't receive comfort if there's no need for the comfort. So God has designed this in a way where there's a scenario that you're going to need to receive comfort, but not to be comfortable, to give comfort. It's to give comfort. And only when we understand others do we sense an urge to comfort and step in and say, it's going to be okay, man. You'll get through this. It's, it's, it's only when we understand others do we really have a sense. Because I'll tell you, the world will tell you. Culture will tell you. Some of your friends will tell you, you don't need to ask help for that. That's a small thing. It's embarrassing. Why would you need? Or sometimes the world will tell you, You've gone to your friend, you've gone to this person, you've gone to so-and-so seven times. If you go an eighth time, you're going to annoy the hell out of your friend and your friend is going to call you clingy and needy and then they're going to ditch you. Then you'll truly be screwed. Been there? Yeah. Yeah. Now catch this. Catch this. But when you've gone through it, Because you didn't abort the dark room. Mm-hmm. You didn't hit the eject button yep. in your tough time. Mm-hmm. You didn't hit the quit button because you went through it. Mm-hmm. They can come to you 16 times and you still have the same sense of purpose and compassion to comfort. Yeah, that's right. Because we can only comfort to the degree that we've suffered. Yeah. Tell you a true story. I went through something for nine weeks, about 11 weeks very difficult battle in my mind. And in that same time, some of the leaders in our church were going through very dark battles too. And all of us thought that our battles were too small to talk about because we didn't want to burden ourselves and each other with our small battles. But there came a point with some of the leaders, they were like, I can't hold this in any longer. And they would speak because it was just tormenting their minds. And they told me, Pastor, it's been like, you know, seven weeks. and I've been battling with this thing. I'm like, why didn't you come earlier? Because it's so small. Right? Can you relate? It's too small to tell someone. And they told me. And then after that, a trajectory of many follow-up meetings came where they would come to me about the same thing over and over and over and over. And then here's the main question they would ask me. Aren't you sick and tired of me? To which I responded, three, four years ago, I would have. But because I'm going through what I'm going through, but because I'm going through my dark room, you can come to me all the times you need to. Because I understand. Because I understand. Because I know. I know. I understand. I feel. I comprehend. I grasp your pain. I know what it's like to battle with the same thing. Fall back, square one, all over again. You made progress with three steps, now you're step one all over again. I know that pain. So you can come to me all the times you want because I understand. How do you know that Jesus is real and among us when we choose to love each other? There's no better way to love than you Sometimes choosing to go through your dark room. To allow God to work something in you for the sake of others. So let's go back to the question. Here's the question. What do you do when there's nothing that you can do? Well, let's recap the three weeks that we've been here. Number one, believe that God is up to something. 
Believe that he's up to something, that he's going to work something in. Believe that he's doing, just like Lazarus was permitted to die. And he said, the loved, your loved one, your loved one is sick. Jesus was like, all right, sit down, sit back down. We're going to go back to Bible study. And then he showed up two days later. And then Martha and Mary came up to me. If you would have been here. And then Jesus was like, shut up. I'm up to something. I'm up to something that you don't know. That something that you don't understand. Something that you don't expect. And it's for the glory of God. And this is where he shifts the paradigm on people that were there. He shifts the paradigm on faith. And he speaks to a dead man. And the dead man walks. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Choose to believe that God is up to something. Right. Number two, let allow, like allow perseverance to finish its work. Look at me for a few seconds. Many people never mature in their Christian walk because they quit when it gets tough. And they think that knowing more scripture equals maturity. Knowing more scripture equals being smart. They think that obeying a whole bunch of rules and regulation makes them mature. That doesn't make you mature. It makes you obedient. Right. What makes a Christian mature is when you allow perseverance to finish its work so that you will be mature and complete, lacking nothing. That's right. That's right. What do you do? What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Believe God is up to something. Allow perseverance to finish its work. And watch this. Let, I think this is, receive God's comfort to give God's comfort. That's good. Three weeks. And the reason is because we go back to that one statement. You never know what or who hangs in the balance of your decision to remain faithful when remaining faithful is difficult. Thank you for watching our weekly talk at Crave Church. A new sermon will be released every week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on your post notifications. With that, you'll be notified each time we upload a new sermon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.